Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Streamline's AI Supply Chain Planning Webinar Series. My name is Keith Drake. I'm the Vice President of Sales North America for Streamline. Our topic today is best practices for demand forecasting and inventory planning in 2023, a very relevant topic. Our guest today is also from Streamline, Malcolm O'Brien. He is a supply chain expert here at Streamline. Hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here and to meet all of you. Really looking forward to seeing your questions and having a productive conversation. Thank you, Malcolm. I'm looking forward to it as well. We can go ahead to the next slide. We'll discuss uh, the webinar logistics today. In your Zoom console, there's a Q&A panel. Please submit your Q&A uh, session questions at any time in that window. And at the end of the webinar, we've, we've carved out plenty of time to address your specific questions, both relative to our best practices that we'll review today and to any topic in supply chain planning. Um, in the chat window right now, we're posting a link. The link will provide a handout to Streamline about Streamline, and it's available for you to click on and download right now. We will perform a poll uh, during the webinar to learn more about our audience and what your specific supply chain uh, planning challenges are. And then we always get this question, a recording of this webinar will be provided in a follow-up email to all registrants. So let's go to the next slide and we'll overview our presentation for today. Malcolm, if we can go to the, there we go. All yeah, right, there you go. a little bit of a little bit of a time lag. Uh, we're we're located all over the globe here, so we're subject to that. Thank you. Uh, just to overview, streamline the company and our platform. Uh, again, we're very excited to be here today. Um, our topic is very relevant to the supply chain industry, and I think we're going to have a very valuable discussion for you. Uh, just to briefly comment on, on Streamline, independent sources such as G2 recognize our leadership in providing supply chain planning solutions since 2009. We've been around for a while. Our footprint is global, with over 200 implementation partners and more than 1,200 clients throughout the world. Uh, our customers span all industries and all components of the supply chain, from manufacturers to wholesalers to distributors and retailers. Our streamlined solution is an AI-based platform for demand forecasting and inventory planning. And out of the box, our streamlined solution provides very accurate demand forecasts and robust inventory replenishment plans based on your historical data, your current inventory, your orders in transit, and any ordering constraints that you're subject to. As we will see today, many areas of the streamlined platform can be tailored to meet your business model and industry conditions, and your specific business processes. We're gonna try hard not to make this a commercial, of course, but we will use the Streamline platform to illustrate the best practices that Malcolm and I will discuss today. Before we get started, uh, let's take a, a brief poll. If you could post in the chat window where you're from, we'd just like to get a bit of a handle on where everybody is located. Um, I see Mississauga, Canada. I've I've been there. Uh, South Africa. We've got two continents covered: Knoxville, Tennessee, India. Uh, Ontario, Canada. San Diego, California. Hello, Andy. Uh, wow, all over the place. Cary, North Carolina. Mumbai, India. Guatemala, Tampa, Florida. Londonderry, New Hampshire, truly all over the globe. I probably missed the vast majority of our attendees. I apologize for that, but very exciting uh, that our topic today is, a, is one of global interest. All right, let's, um, let's tee things up and kick things off today. Our webinar today uh, will discuss some common supply chain planning challenges, such as supplier unpredictability, which I'm sure we're all subject to, uh, historical sales data and distribution data that are impacted by various disruptions, such as, as we're, some of us are still experiencing the global COVID pandemic, 
And then always a challenge forecasting the demand for new products, whether they be totally new, a replacement product, a substitution product, we'll be reviewing some best practices for that as well. Before we dive into our first topic though, uh, I wanna share some, uh, some prefacing thoughts. You know, supply chain unpredictability is the new normal for sure. It has been for at least a couple of years and it will be for the foreseeable future. Our jobs, our responsibilities are very challenging. Uh, I read recently in a World Economic Forum report that senior executives in operations and in supply chain management, that they expect the impact on disruption on corporate value to increase by up to 25% over the next few years, and that only 12% of companies are adequately protected against future disruptions in supply chain and operations. So I, I think that tells us that many of us are aware of the issue. We react to various uh, issues, but we're not prepared to proact. Some of our best practices today will hopefully shift your focus from reacting to being proactive. Uh, in response to these, uh, these uh, factoids that I just uh, shared with you, Gartner reports that 23% of supply chain leaders expect to have a digital supply chain ecosystem by 2025. I know many of the folks that we talk to who are interested in our platform, they start the conversation with, we are transitioning to a digital stack for all of our supply chain planning and management. Uh, so it's good to see that shift in focus, but I think across the industry, it's still ongoing. So each of our three topics today deal with uncertainty and how to squeeze maximum risk out of your supply chain equation in the specific areas of demand forecasting and inventory planning. As I mentioned previously, after we suggest best practices in these three areas, we'll briefly show how to implement the approach in Streamline with a quick demonstration. There are certainly other ways to implement what we're suggesting as best practices. I would suggest to everybody that the key focus is, does the best practice make sense for you, your company, your business processes? And more importantly, how can you automate the implementation of that best practice? Uh, Malcolm, anything else to add before we dive in? Um, yeah, thanks, Keith. I, I would say supply chain unpredictability has ironically become quite predictable uh, in the new normal. So it was really interesting and, and frankly shocking to hear the size of those numbers and the impacts having on businesses. Uh, I think COVID has made it painfully clear that excellent supply chain management is not just the cost of doing business to be minimized, but an opportunity, right? A, a potential source of competitive advantage. And it's about preparation. When the inevitable next disruption comes, whatever it may be, if you are the business that is more resilient, better prepared, then you will be the business left with improved customer satisfaction, revenue, market share, however you measure success. Hey, uh, you reminded me, a, a colleague at one of our partner organizations recently said, I am interrupt driven. In other words, totally reactive. As I commented a minute ago, many of the best practices with a little bit of effort can become, can transition from you in a state of, of reaction, being interrupt driven to being proactive and even mitigate that risk before it occurs. Okay, good comments. Thank you, Malcolm. Let's dive in. Our first of three best practices, we're going to talk about supplier unpredictability, arguably the uh, one of the biggest of the uh, of the, the biggest of the three. Uh, some common examples are a supplier changes their delivery date, supplier changes their order quantity, or both. There are certainly multiple sources of unpredictability. At every point in the supply chain, these common examples are just a few. Uh, so among the most frequent and with the highest impact is unpredictability among suppliers, from manufacturers to upstream distributors, any organization that's supplying us with inventory. So we're going to take a quick look at these issues and then suggest both some tactical methods to react and strategic methodologies to reduce this risk. With the common examples on the left here as examples, uh, we're gonna suggest some tactical best practices 
reactive first and then move on to strategic uh, methodologies. Uh, some tactical best practices to be reactive to what seems to be constant supplier unpredictability is to change the order status in the ERP to maintain a single source of truth. Many of our clients have a digital technology stack of several systems. It works quite well with them, but the best practice is to make that change in that order date, that delivery quantity upstream so that all the downstream systems uh, are singing off the same song sheet. And so the ERP would then update the subsequent supply chain planning platform. Uh, many planning solutions, such as Streamline, allow changes to specific fields, specific uh, pieces of information like supplier lead time, shipment qualities, supplier lead time variance, and other ordering and delivering parameters. I want to talk about that third bullet briefly, uh, supplier lead time variance. If you are collecting data from your suppliers in the variance of uh, the, the difference between their, their contractual obligation and when they actually deliver, that can potentially be very valuable information to, do, to perform your supply chain, uh, your inventory planning with. Knowing what the variances of your suppliers, how predictable they are, can become a very useful factor. So the summary on this slide is it's best to make changes upstream at the source. Now let's move forward and talk about some strategic best practices. Uh, they include, and we're gonna demonstrate this here in our solution platform in a second, but synchronize orders of all items for each supplier. Let your, what that does is that lets your suppliers understand your supply needs, your order requirements, and you become predictable to your suppliers. The more predictable you can become to your suppliers, the less unpredictable they become with you. Sounds simple, and there actually is a very simple uh, uh, actionable piece of actionable information that we'll show you here in a second within Streamline to affect that. And what that is on the fourth bullet is the transition from a min-max or replenishment point ordering strategy to a periodic ordering strategy. In other words, instead of having a set point that includes safety stock that you draw down inventory to and then reorder right then and there at that point, save that and order on a more periodic basis. Uh, this does reduce uncertainty. It minimizes risk. It may mean carrying a little bit more inventory a little bit sooner. So there is that um, carrying cost, but it will help solve quite a few of the issues that are associated with supplier unpredictability. Malcolm, before I grab the screen and, and move to the quick demonstration of Streamline, anything to add? Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, I would say, yeah, when, when dealing with uncertainty, uh, readiness and foresight enable speed, which are all keys to success. And synchronizing orders with your suppliers and establishing predictability are ways you can take what is out of your control. You cannot control your supplier's supply chain, but you can make yourself more predictable to them. You can bring that into your locus of control so that when the emergency or unforeseen disruption comes, whatever it is, a new COVID or a new Suez, the Suez Canal gets blocked again, both you and your suppliers have more time and attention as resources to funnel towards exception handling rather than trying to run your business and fight new fires at the same time. That's right. Okay, good comments. I'm going to switch. I'm going to grab the screen from you, Malcolm, if that's okay. And we're going to explore very briefly in our Streamline Solution platform how to make yourself more predictable to suppliers. A brief overview of Streamline. Streamline has a number of major modules. They include demand forecasting, inventory planning, a very broad range of reports, both projections and historical, and then a KPI dashboard, both at the top level and the detailed level, to measure your progress in reducing overstock, stockouts, and a number of other KPIs. What I'm going to demonstrate now, how do we become more predictable to our suppliers? Uh, many systems allow the ability to define a replenishment planning. 
uh, a replenishment strategy rather, either periodic or min-max replenishment point. Uh, the more desirable to become predictable to your suppliers would be periodic, but I'll select min-max. And now what we have is um, a set of planned orders based on that min-max strategy. What we wanna see, however, is over time, how will that work out? Over time, will a min-max strategy versus a periodic strategy actually reduce the number of orders for the same amount of inventory, for the same SKUs from our suppliers? Streamline includes a very uh, useful feature. We call it time machine. It's a dynamic simulation where you can play forward in time a replenishment plan against ordering constraints underlying a demand forecast to see how things happen in the future. I'll run Time Machine in this min-max uh, replenishment strategy forward six months. What Streamline is doing right now for this very simple inventory is every event that changes the inventory, every purchase order, every rece uh, receipt of shipment, a transfer from one warehouse to another, is being calculated, recalculated, and stored to compute a number of things. Now, I ran this offline earlier, and here we see the results. I've exported the results. The results of running a min-max replenishment strategy versus the results of a periodic replenishment strategy over the same period of time, over the same six-month period. The results are with a min-max strategy, we are placing 84 separate orders to our suppliers over that six month period to meet demand, maintain safety stock, but not overshoot and have overstock issues. If we switch to a periodic ordering strategy, you can see the to order the same inventory is only 51 orders. That's about 40% fewer orders, yeah, about 40% fewer orders just by switching to a periodic strategy. Now, that's the simple part. The simple part is switching that set strategy. Does your supply chain planning platform support that? That's up to you to answer. The major challenge though, this is another best practice, is within your organization to shift focus, to shift policy from a min-max ordering strategy to a periodic strategy. Sometimes that's straightforward in larger organizations it becomes more of a challenge. Uh, before we move on, Malcolm, anything else to add to the demonstration here? Um, yeah, I, I'd just like to highlight some of what you said there, Keith. I, I find that many in many conversations I have, many, many people undervalue this switch between periodic ordering and, and min-max. Um, once you find the right, I think Keith demonstrated it very well, the number of orders was nearly half, right? And so through automation or, or software, or however you, you guys decide to enable this, right? It's elegant in that you're doing, you're ordering less, so you're doing less work and there's less potential points of failure in the supply chain, less boats, less crates, less planes, whatever, however you guys do business but you're also lowering costs in the supply chain by keeping less safety stock and decreasing uncertainty. And the leaders are always telling us, oh, do more with less. And we think to ourselves, what does that mean? This is one of the ways that you can do that. It's about all about uh, automation. That's right. Decide the policy and then have a platform to automate it. All right, we'll move on to our second of three best practices. And that's historical data disruptions. Um, we're all subject to it. The list of causes on the left that I'll review briefly here in a second are just a subset of what we hear on a daily basis from our customers and that we help them with. Uh, some causes of data dis historical data disruptions, historical data in terms primarily of our historical sales and or distribution data. So inflation and high interest rates are affecting us all, causing uncertainty in our supply chain. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine that occurred a little over a year ago, though many of us may say, well, how did that affect supply chain? That had a huge effect throughout Europe on the supply chain for agricultural products. Uh, Ukraine, in many ways, is a breadbasket of at least Eastern Europe, if not all of Europe, in many categories. And the Russian invasion disrupted 
that supply chain and caused data disruptions. Uh, we're, we always unfortunately have global trade conflicts that we have to deal with, um, stockouts during unanticipated demand surges. Good problem to have, but causes historical data disruption. Supplier unpredictability, as we talked about a minute ago. And what I mean by historical data disruptions are both artificially zero sales or artificially low sales. Historical data that we collected but may not be totally reflective of our industry, our company, and therefore shouldn't totally be relied on to make demand forecasts moving forward. So best practices uh, is to revise your demand forecasting strategy to recognize disrupted historical data at a minimum manually, as I'll show you here in a second within our streamlined solution, or in a more automated fashion, if possible. Here, though, we're recommending that the best practice do not change your source data. In other words, upstream in your ERP. The source data or the truth data has not changed, but we need to revise it within our supply chain planning environment to best take advantage of the fact that we know there's been disruptions and how to deal with them. Uh, Malcolm, I'll ask you again, uh, anything else to add at this point? Uh, well said, Keith. I think I would say, how, how do you fight on predictability? You fight it with good science, good data, um, speed. I think adaptability and measurability are key here. You need to recognize the change in the market, create a model you think uh, represents the, the new market, right, and measure its performance going forward. Um, to determine whether you scrap the model and, and start over. And digitization is uh, enables all of that, right? A, a basic statistical framework to start with, a visual sandbox to test your model with historical data, analytics to track performance, automation to save your, your time and energy and, and give you more time to focus on the exception handling later. Makes sense, makes a lot of sense. But again, easily said, a little bit more challenging to implement at times, but we know we need to do it. All right, I am uh, I'm sharing my screen again, Malcolm. Very good. So here's Streamline again, and now we're gonna focus on the demand uh, forecasting area. As a brief tour of the demand forecasting area, in the upper left, we see our item tree. In this very simple example, we don't have locations. Streamline is multi-echelon regarding locations, distribution centers, warehouses, sales region. However your business operates, we can replicate within the platform. And distribution channels as well, customers, can also be represented in the item tree. Here in the middle, upper middle, we see our sales and operation planning grid. In this uh, example, I should have commented earlier, the current date, today's date is January 1st. 2023. So historical information to the left, projections to the right. And then down below, we see a, a graph of some of the data in the SNOP area. In uh, gray is the historical sales, a plot of this first row. In blue and in red is the model that uh, is selected and configured through Streamline's AI-based processing. In blue is how well that model fits the historical data. And then in red is the demand forecast moving forward. In, let's see, what have I picked here? In this case, for this SKU, Streamline has suggested that there's seasonality and trend information in the model. But we can see here that in November and December, we had zero sales. Uh, let's say uh, we actually did record zero sales, but due to some anomaly. And we know that our supply chain planning platform, specifically demand forecasting solution, should not consider that. They are artificial. They won't occur again. We mitigated the risk. Uh, the best practice would be to simply ignore those points. Now, I'll focus your attention on the graphical area down below. As I click these checkboxes, which read ignore actual sales, you can see that everything changes. And now when we ignore both November and December, we see a much flatter demand forecast moving forward. These two zero historical sales months artificially created a trend that the platform recognized. 
So we recognize that's not correct data. Let's just ignore those two months. And now we have what is likely a much more accurate demand forecast moving forward. Uh, Malcolm and I have mentioned several times, automation's the key. You don't wanna be clicking on individual SKUs all day. That does not free up your time. In your solution, it, implementing this practice, it would be very useful to have a global setting to ignore zero sales. And when we do, we've, we've ignored zero sales across our entire item tree and Streamline has readjusted accordingly. So quick demonstration, uh, but one example of how to recognize and account for historical data disruptions. Malcolm, anything to add? Uh, yeah, briefly, yes, actually. Um, I would say it's important your data deal with, or uh, excuse me, it's important that your, your strategy for processing that data deal with disruptions uh, like zero data or missing data, like Keith has shown, a classic is uh, Chinese New Year, but um, art also artificially high outliers. So things like uh, one-time promotions, for example, that will not occur again. Uh, the idea here is, is when your data is not representative, and, and that's a judgment call, um, then your, your strategy should automatically detect these situations and enable you to focus on the exception management. You mentioned Chinese New Year. While that's not supplier unpredictability, for many of us, the uh, factories in China shut down for, what, a couple of weeks. We know that it's coming, but how do we deal with it? It's anomalous in terms of it only occurs one month out of the year. So a best practice there is to account for that in an automated fashion, as you just suggested. All right. Good discussion. Good discussion so far. I see there's a lot of questions coming in and, and we will get to them here in just a few minutes during our Q&A session. Uh, our third topic is new product demand forecasting. Uh, just about everybody has an opportunity, uh, has the need rather, the requirement to forecast the demand for products for which there is no sales history, no distribution history. Uh, some simple use cases are product substitutions. We introduce model 1189X to replace model 1189. Uh, product replacements, we have a, a uh, we replace that model 1189X by model 1200. Same general product, but new features, new functionality. It's an upgrade versus an update as in the first bullet. And then probably the most challenging example is a, uh, completely new products for which we have no similar sales, no sales history for um, similar products. In, this, in these cases, the best practice is to model the demand so that we can forecast it using patterns or models from similar items with representative, i.e. similarly characteristic sales history. Those could be individual planning items uh, where a planning item is a SKU location channel combination. Maybe the same product, the same SKU number, but depending on the sales region and the distribution channel, its historical sales may be very, very different. So that's a key point to consider as well. Or as we'll see here in a minute, entire product categories. Uh, Malcolm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab the screen again but um, anything else to add at this point? Uh, I would say new product forecasting is uh, a balance of art and science, right? You need to get the data from somewhere. It's certainly better than starting with nothing or just guessing, but um, you know, it can be from other models. It can be from the market or surveys. It can be from your stakeholders. Um, but then uh, continuing to update and iterate that is the scientific piece of that process, right? Bor borrowing data is great, but just like Keith said, if you put the same coffee in a different country, right? Um, the Americans have very different coffee drinking habits than let's say the Italians. So it may not be representative, but when, when new data comes in, have a look at, have a look again at your model and say, is, is it working as intended? Look at your KPIs. Automation and AI work wonders here for saving time and energy. You know, I, I, I often um, ask folks, do you have new products 
that you have no sales history or similar sales history for? Almost always the answer is yes, we're looking to grow. We just acquired a company. We do have new products that fit within our portfolio, but they fill a gap. We have no sales history. What do we do? I'm going to show two very quick examples of how we would borrow the pattern from one SKU or product category and apply it to a new product with historic, with zero historical sales. Here in our item tree, we see we have three building materials, concrete blocks, nails, and dimensional lumber. Dimensional lumber is the new product that we are just going to begin selling. For nails, we see, as we saw before in the demonstration, seasonality and trend information. Dimensional lumber, though, is not quite as interesting. We see zero historical sales. It's a new product. We see a thousand two by fours inventory on hand, and that's it. That's all the information we have. Down in the graphical area, the gray line, zero historical sales. So despite the uh, AI power under the hood of Streamline, its best uh, guess, if you will, its best estimate is you've not sold any in the past, you're not gonna sell any in the future. We know that's not true because it's a new product. What we will do in this case though, is we recognize because of our, our expertise in our, in our industry vertical, that we're very confident that the seasonality exhibited by nails will be the same as for two by fours. So a lot of, lot of platforms out there, a lot of solutions, a lot of methodologies to implement what I'm about to show you. Some are more manual. What I'll show you here is highly automated. We can go to the model parameters for nails and we can save that pattern. I will give it a name, seasonality pattern, nails. And when I save it, that seasonality pattern, that pattern that Streamline detected for nails from the historical data by applying a, a, a toolkit of advanced statistical techniques and an AI-based expert system is now available for application throughout the item tree. I'll show you how to do that. We're, we're now looking at dimensional lumber. And here is that seasonality pattern that I just saved. When I apply it, we still have zero historical sales, but now we have a demand forecast moving forward. Uh, I should have mentioned earlier, the green curve is your beginning of period and end of period inventory projections. Over time, your system should use a combination of the initial assumption, as I just showed you here, but then also factor in month over month, period over period, the actual sales and fine tune that starting point, that model that it started with to provide even more accurate demand forecasts. I'll show you another example that is a best practice that any supply chain planning solution should provide. And that's in the category of apparel. Uh, we have been selling swimwear for quite a while. We see the historical sales, we see the demand pattern, but we just started carrying t-shirts. Beatles t-shirts, four sizes, zero historical sales. Uh, previously, I saved this pattern for swimwear. And now what I will do is I will apply it at the category level for t-shirts. Actually, I should have. There we go. So there's, sorry about that. There's our starting point. Zero sales history, zero demand moving forward. Now, when I apply that seasonality pattern that I previously say from swimwear, we're assuming that when more swimwear are sold, more t-shirts are sold, summer months. When I select that, we now have a demand forecast, not only at the category level, but for each of our four individual SKUs. Again, best practice is to use your judgment expertise but have an automated process for taking the characteristics from a product that's going to act similar and apply those to your new product to create a demand forecast moving forward. Malcolm, anything, uh, what did I miss? Anything uh, I left out here? Uh, I would, I would say I'll keep it brief just because I see so many questions in the chat, but, uh, I think that was a great example of using existing demand patterns to, for new products. I would say 
Uh, it's also important to have a strategy for substitutions. I think that was actually one of the questions and uh, product replacements. So um, uh, Streamline handles that automatically, but uh, the ha having a strategy that can understand that nuance is also important because it does affect the accuracy of the forecast. Yeah, that's a good point. You mentioned product replacements. There is a, a feature within Streamline where we can make that definition. At this point in the future, product 1189 is going to be replaced by product 1189X, or it can be a substitution. It can be a hard replacement or a substitution where either or can be sold. Streamline takes all that into account. All right. Uh, those are our three, our three uh, topics for today. Uh, what I like to do is suggest, you know, for your option and consideration, what your next steps should be, actual information. Um, we can't, you can see us, we can't see you, but I imagine there's a lot of heads nodding all around the globe right now that the, uh, the challenges that we've outlined apply to you probably on a daily basis for many of you, and that some of our best practices would add value to your organization. So I'll suggest three next steps. Um, first, is to develop a strategy that automates a response to data disruptions. Everybody experiences data disruptions, but they're all different. Uh, over the course of a month even, I talked to several dozen companies. Uh, their problems, their challenges are all different. So everybody's data disruption issues are likely to be, likely to vary somewhat. So think about what makes sense for you, what makes sense in the context of an automated process that allows you to apply a strategy to deal with data disruption issues. In a similar fashion, number two, uh, your next step would be to develop in, and launch a plan to quickly respond to supplier unpredictability. We suggested one methodology that uh, when our clients implement it, they, they almost immediately within two or three months, see the value in switching from a replenishment point min-max strategy to a periodic strategy. But that may not work for you. So uh, we suggest to think about for supplier unpredictability, what works best for you? How can you make yourself more predictable to your suppliers? And then number three, if, if there's interest here, uh, contact us for a free consultation. We'd like to learn what your specific challenges and needs are and um, work together and have a conversation about how Streamline can add value to your business. Our contact information will be provided on a couple of the subsequent slides. We're gonna move to our Q&A session here in a second, but before we do, we're gonna uh, launch our first poll. So I'll ask our producer to uh, launch the poll. And on your screens right now, you should be seeing a uh, dialogue. There we go right there, poll number one. So we've covered a lot of ground here today in the context of three best practices, but I think we've talked about all these challenges. If you could select one or two of your challenges, uh, we'd appreciate that. Are your challenges producing accurate demand forecasts or perhaps uh, automating the process of replenishment or ordering plans. Third challenge would be responding to supplier unpredictability. Uh, number four, compensating or mitigating historical data disruptions. Some of you probably experience more, some less. And then number five, forecasting the demand for new products. Wow, I see lots and lots of responses coming in. I'll give everybody just another few seconds, another 10, 15 seconds or so to respond. So if you could just select one or two, uh, what is your greatest challenge right now, today, and for the near-term future? Accurate demand forecasts, automated replenishment order plans, producing them, uh, responding to supplier unpredictability, compensating for historical data disruptions, or forecasting the demand for new products. And please do answer the poll, everyone, because this informs our, our conversations with people like you have informed this webinar, and this is your chance to, to maybe see something on the list that you'd like us to do a deeper dive into later. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. 
And there we go. All right, I am not able to display this, so I'll just briefly review verbally for everybody. Uh, number one, by far and away, is accurate demand forecasts. Certainly, uh, and that makes a lot of sense. If we can forecast what do we think is going to happen in an accurate uh, fashion, then we'll know how to respond to it. Demand forecasting, what's going to happen, uh, inventory planning, what do we need to do about it? So accurate demand forecast was selected by a little over two thirds of our participants. Uh, number two, uh, forecasting the demand for new products. Uh, almost half of you selected that. Uh, quite a few of the folks we talked to, that is an issue, but uh, that's a little bit higher than I would have expected. So uh, that, that's interesting. And then uh, almost equal portions are answers two, three, and four with number three responding to supplier unpredictability uh, being, being the most. I think I'm sharing the results now. I just found a new button in the Zoom console. So there you go. There's your results right there. All right, I'll go ahead and kill that so we can move on to the next slide. We'll make a couple announcements. Uh, we are very active within the supply chain planning industry. Part of our activity is our relationships with Forbes, specifically Forbes.com. Um, Alex, that you see listed here, he is a Forbes Council member on the Forbes Technology Council, and that allows him the opportunity to uh, provide thought leadership articles every two or three months. So last year, 2022, we published these three articles. And then in 2023, we published two more. Uh, in your chat right now, I'll ask our producer to provide the link to the button you see there, all authors articles, if you could scroll forward, there we go. Uh, so you'll see the button there, all authors articles. Now in the chat should be appearing a link that'll take you to Forbes and all five of the articles that you see here. Okay, uh, let's move on to our Q&A session. This is gonna be very dynamic here. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, please submit your questions in the Q&A window in the Zoom console. A recording of our webinar, including the Q&A session will be available via email. I'm going to open and ask you to do the same thing. All right, I'm just going to start at the top here. What is the best way to account for shelf life with perishable products? Great question. Uh, perishable products not only include agricultural items, of course, that do have a shelf life. Uh, that could be months to years, could be as few as days to hours. Uh, but they can be other types of products as well, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and there's probably a number of other categories I'm not thinking of right now. So what is the best way to account for shelf life? Your inventory planning, your ordering system should have a methodology to recognize that and perhaps order a little bit product uh, that's uh, sooner to meet a future demand. It's also important for your supply chain planning, your inventory planning, your ordering system to recognize it may be the same planning item, that SKU, location, channel combination, but a different manufacturing line, a different block, which each has its own date. So the item tree that I showed you in Streamline earlier certainly displays graphically those first three, SKU number, location, channel, but a very important fourth uh, item that, um, that, dif that distinguishes or defines that planning item is the expiration date. Okay, um, I'm not able to mark that as answered. So I'll move on here. Is Streamline a plug into ERP systems to better streamline demand forecasting? Will it complement SAP or Oracle systems? Uh, to answer the second question, well, to answer both at once, we have uh, quite a few integrations to existing ERP systems wouldn't call it a plug-in, it's more of a direct uh, connection to an API interface. If your ERP is not on our list, that is almost never an issue. Uh, we do all of our connections and integrations in-house. We have a very skilled team of developers that uh, haven't met a challenge yet. That's for sure. 
All right, so we can mark that as answered. I'm going to move uh, that just to just to expand on what Keith said. Uh, we have, for example, some pre-existing connectors to SAP, different models of SAP, and uh, for example, NetSuite. So these are partnerships we commonly have. Absolutely. Okay, I'm scanning the questions here. How to streamline deal with phasing out products at the end of life or end of contracts? Malcolm, is that one you want to grab? Because we we touched on it briefly. You touched on it briefly during your wrap on demo three. Sure. Um, so Streamline has a, a product substitution uh, feature specifically for this, and it can understand the nuance between um, uh, full replacement or phasing in and out or some level of uh, or being sold in parallel. So all of these things can be uh, understood and ac accommodated for by Streamline. Yeah, and I'll, as a best practice, whether it's Streamline, another platform, a manual methodology, whatever your methodology is for taking into account end of life, phasing out products, set that up as soon as you know when that phase out date is. The, the longer lead time, and I know this from Streamline, the longer stream, uh, lead time Streamline has, the better it can plan for that phase out. And that phase out should be either a direct product replacement, product A, product B. On a certain date in the future, no longer sell product A, only sell product B. Or the alternative, sell both products until my inventory of A is depleted. Those are two different situations. Each of what one or the other is going to be appropriate to your business process, but they could result in very different ordering plans. Uh, another question for you, Malcolm, what is the best way to address forecast accuracy? I like that. Uh, uh, thank you, Keith. I'd, I'd love to hear an elaboration from the audience member about what specifically they're asking about. But uh, when it comes to, for example, using forecast accuracy, I, I would say it's the classic scientific process. So uh, measure, change something, and then uh, measure again. So comparing forecasts to, uh, you know, plan versus actual is a report that, for example, Streamline uses very often looking at it month after month after month. Are we getting the forecast right? What is the gap between what we predicted versus actual? Is it trending in the right direction? You'd hope that would get smaller over time. And, you know, there are many statistical measures you can use to improve the accuracy of your prediction, right? removing anomalies and outliers, as we discussed, looking at, um, Mean absolute percentage error is a classic. Uh, however, you guys do that. So measure it, change something, measure it again. And be diligent about doing that. That's right. Uh, here's another question that just came in a few minutes ago. I'll toss it to you, Malcolm. Can Streamline be used in forecasting and planning for e commerce channels? Uh, can it be used for 500 or more SKUs? Sure. Great question. And simply yes. Uh, and can it be used for 500 plus SKUs? I would say, you know, Streamline has been, you know, actual client use. We have a, a client that is a, a significant retailer in the Middle East. They have something like, I, I think, 250 mega stores in different locations, all with many, many different products. So I, I think it adds up to more than a million SKUs. Streamline has been, you know, uh, battle tested for that, and then stress tested for 10 million SKUs, so 10 times that volume. Um, we don't expect to run into particular problems. E-commerce uh, is a very common business model that we work with as well. So simply yes. Laura asks, how does Streamline incorporate AI? Uh, at the top level, uh, Streamline employs a two-step process when looking at the historical sales data stream to develop a demand forecast model. The first step is a very thorough statistical analysis to identify outliers. Uh, we saw two outliers today, the two November and December 2021, those two periods of zero historical sales. So a lot of the statistical analysis identifies outliers, does something which is called uh, identifying the relevant history depth. Relevant history depth is how far back in time can I go such that my data of historical sales has the same characteristics and prior to which the characteristics are different and I should ignore that data. That relevant history depth 
is likely different for every planning item. After that statistical characterization, Streamline then employs its AI-based expert system to take those characteristics, select and configure a model type. So in a nutshell, that's how that works. Malcolm, uh, back over to you. Uh, how can I deal with constantly changing lead times from my suppliers? So there are a couple methods. It depends on how manual your process is. But for example, uh, Keith brought up a good one during the webinar, which is lead time variance. So if you're aware of, um, you know, some suppliers are more reliable than others and uh, having a safety stock that is correlated with how reliable your suppliers is, is a good way to save yourself headache and money in the future. So that's a classic one. Um, so, uh, another is simply sandboxing and changing lead times to simulate what that might look like. So for example, if you can see a disruption coming, maybe you're not aware of the exact impact it will have on your business. You can double your lead times. You can triple your lead times, run a simulation and say, here's what my supply chain would look like if my lead times for this group of suppliers were to double based on maybe based on geography. Uh, and then you can look at the financial impact of, of that uh, unpredictability and say, is that acceptable? Can I simply absorb that? Or do I have to develop a risk management plan because this outcome is unacceptable? That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, you mentioned, this is a good segue, you mentioned safety stock uh, in, your, in your comments just now, Malcolm. Another question is, what method do you recommend to calculate? safety stock? What approach? So that uh, that's a great question. And I would say it depends, as Keith said, on your, your specific business circumstance and, and objectives. Um, there, there are classics like Keith brought up, which are min-max, something based on service level, something based on a, a more statistical or fluid demand forecast. Um, and I would say uh, just ensuring that there, there's a pro con for all of those. Obviously, min max is very simple, right? It, it's easy to begin. You just pick a number. Um, and of course, on the other end, it may not accurately reflect reality. So I would say marrying your business circumstance with your, your the amount of time and energy you're willing to put into this strategy and maintain it along with the level of results you expect, right? How, how much lift are you expecting to get by changing your safety stock strategy or good ways to help you pick? Indeed. We've got uh, time for a few more questions. Here's a good one from Elijah. How can I encourage change in a family business with the large age gap in employees? In other words, how can I implement new processes that require skill sets outside of current employee knowledge? Uh, a best practice is to, if, if you are, I'm assuming you're transitioning or at least have the objective to transition, to a digital technology stack away from manual Excel-based, Excel-driven processes. If that's the case, the best practice is to focus on a solution that employs a lot of technology, but is very, two things, very user-friendly, easy to navigate, and provides visibility throughout the supply chain planning process. Uh, we'd like to think Streamline checks both those boxes, but regardless, a solution that does check both those boxes, uh, three boxes, a lot of power and technology under the hood, ease of use, and visibility to all users, I think you'll find that that, um, that lack of required skill sets is probably not as great as you may think that it is. Uh, it's something we'd really like to chat to you about, Elijah. You see the contact information here on the screen. Give us a shout, and uh, we'll have a conversation. And and just to add, uh, piggyback on what Keith said, uh, there's also, you know, asking businesses about the services they provide around training and enablement is a good ask as well. Um, many businesses will hand you the keys to a car and say, uh, there you go, it's up to you, and no news is good news, right? Uh, so you don't want to be left holding that and having to deal with it or having to build a, a shed from a set of tools you haven't, you don't yet know how to use. That's right. Malcolm, I'll toss this one to you. This one came in during registration. When, when can we expect the market to be normal, 
recovering after COVID and supply shortages, raw materials and lost vendors? Well, uh, if I knew the answer to that, Keith, then I'd be uh, playing the stock market, not doing supply chain. But, um, and when I find my crystal ball, I'll, I'll uh, let you know. But uh, I would say there is no such thing, right? There, there will always be disruptions. There's always something new going on. And, you know, what was it? What, what year is it? 2020. So 100 to 300 years ago, we were talking about building trains, right? And then... 170 years after that, we went to space, we went to the moon. And then 50 years from then, no, not even 30 years, we had the internet. And now we have AI, right? So the the pace of change is rapidly accelerating. And that may not be what you want to hear, but uh, that, that means that being able, building a, a supply chain that is resilient and adaptable as it is able to handle the shock of unpredictability is the way of moving forward there isn't a perfect solution because the the best supply chain of the future is something we can't yet imagine makes sense we're we, i think we've got time and i apologize we have not gotten to nearly all the questions that came in during registration nor in the chat window here uh, but I'll I'll answer Fernando's question. I'm going to change the question slightly. Fernando's question is: How can Streamline be applied to a trading company that has alternatives for the same product, and these alternatives can influence the amount to buy between them? Uh, I'll change the question slightly. Can Streamline be applied? The answer is yes, uh, through Streamline's uh, replacement and substitution rules. I think what you describe can be easily configured within Streamline to give you that flexibility. Uh, but Fernando, give us a call. You see the contact information. Love to hear what your, uh, what your needs and requirements are in a little bit more detail. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. I do wanna end uh, on time in respect of other meetings that uh, everybody may have. Uh, sorry that we did not get to everyone's questions. There are several dozen that we didn't get to, but please contact us. Send us a note. Give us a call. We'd love to talk to you. My role, Malcolm's role, a number of others on our team is to work with you to determine if Streamline provides value to your organization. Uh, if the answer is no, we part as friends. If the answer is yes, we form a partnership. So thanks, uh, Thanks, Malcolm, for an engaging discussion. Thanks to our audience for attending our webinar today and your very insightful questions. Uh, you see here on the screen uh, a brief overview of Streamline. As a reminder, uh, we stand ready here at Streamline to help you with your supply chain planning needs. Our, our Streamline uh, solution platform provides an AI-based and we feel very user-friendly and cost-effective solution for demand forecasting and inventory planning. Uh, so we're going to end our webinar today with one more poll, and that's simply your honest feedback. How do you think we did? I'll ask our producer to flash that poll up now. Five choices, excellent, very good, good average, or could be improved. So please be honest, we, we do take this feedback. We do uh, have a very lengthy debrief after each webinar to figure out how we can serve you, the supply chain industry, planning better. Uh, also, contact information is here on the screen. Please let us know what future webinar topics you would like to see. We have a, a very long list right now, but it's dynamic. We want to serve you and provide you with the information that best serves your immediate needs. Uh, contact us to let us know how we can help you with your supply chain planning challenges. Well, we look forward to seeing you at a, a future Streamline webinar. And again, please let us know if there's anything we can do to help you before then. Very nice results, thank you very much. I, I won't share them just to, to, be, uh, to be professional about it, but uh, thank you for the very, uh, very kind ratings. Again, contact us if there's anything we can help you with. And uh, I think that's it for today. See you at our next webinar soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>